<laughs> okay. Um, hello, it's Tam again and also Tom. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about aerobic respiration, what are the reactions, and we're not talking about the alternative respiratory substrates. I don't know why that's there. Um, so, what do you know about respiration? Might be good if you just quickly write down a few things, pause the video. Um, if not, we'll carry on. Okay. Uh, so here's a few things that we know about respiration. Tom. So you probably remember this from GCSE, maybe, um, where we are taking glucose and oxygen and producing carbon dioxide and water, um, and in the process generating some energy, which we're going to call ATP. Um, if you just that's the bottom equation. Um, if you right. Um, so a little summary then of respiration reactions. This is quite a long slide, so if you do want to take down all of these notes, then you'll need to pause the video now. Okay, uh, we're not going to read it out. We're going to move on. Okay, so um, before we talk about all of these reactions, it's quite important that you're aware that we're going to be using something called a coenzyme in them. Okay, now the point of a coenzyme, um, and there's two that you guys are going to look at. NAD and FAD, NAD and FAD, um, the sort of importance of them is that they essentially transport hydrogen from one area in a cell or in, in the mitochondria in this case to another area, okay? So they're going to be transporting it from certain reactions in the mitochondria uh, to the electron transport chain later on. Two hydrogens reduce one molecule of NAD or FAD. Okay, so that's just quite an important thing to bear in mind. Okay, um, Tom, I have a little question for you. So here's Stephen the sloth. Um, he's obviously an animal. Now, where's he going to get his glucose from and how might he store it? Well, I suppose I'm trying to remember what sloths eat, um, but I think they probably eat like fruit and things like that, maybe leaves. Um, well, he so eats caviar and okay, well, only exquisite food. Either way, he is going to originally, he's going to get his glucose from eating something else because he's heterotrophic. He can't actually um, produce glucose himself. He has to eat it. Um, so it comes in, it's absorbed into his bloodstream. Um, now, he might use that glucose straight away, but most likely, because um, sloths aren't very energetic, hence the name, they, um, he's probably going to store it. And being an animal, he would link the glucoses up via glycosidic bonds to produce glycogen and use it and store that in his liver and his muscles. Oh yeah, because um, foie gras, isn't it? They, when they force feed the you know, geese or whatever, um, oh, yeah, we big, like that. big old livers. Yeah, it's not, not, not a very nice thing to lose them. Anyway, um, by so here's a little summary of all of the different reactions in respiration. Um, you can see we've got glycolysis, sort of top left. Um, this big pink thing, by the way, is the mitochondria, or a mitochondrion in this case, um, within a cell, which is the big yellow section. And we're going to be looking at glycolysis, uh, the link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. Okay, So we'll come back to this image and we'll look at whereabouts in the cell each one of those takes place. Okay, So we'll start off with glycolysis, which takes place in the cytoplasm. Okay, okay so um, we're going to talk about glycolysis. Uh, go for it. Okay, so this is, this is the sort of thing that would be happening inside the sloth's cells. It's going to have to release glucose from its glycogen store. So it does that. And there's the glucose. Um, each glucose, six carbons, C6H12O6. The first thing that happens, um, sort of counterintuitively, is that ATP is actually used to activate the glucose. So two ATPs are dephosphorylated and the P is stuck onto the glucose to produce um, hexose phosphate. Still six carbons this, with some P's attached. The hexose phosphate is then split into two three carbon triose phosphates. And these triose phosphates are used to produce two three carbon pyruvate compounds. So the product of glycolysis is one glucose producing two pyruvates. When the pyruvates are generated, you also 
phosphorylate ADP and you actually in total phosphorylate four ADPs um, to produce four ATPs per glucose that is phosphorylation and overall you can see that although you use two ATPs you produce four ATPs so there is a net um, production of two ATPs in glycolysis and this is substrate level phosphorylation you also remove two hydrogens when you produce the pyruvate which is a dehydrogenation reaction and the H's are picked up by NAD remember that's the coenzyme we mentioned previously and the NAD becomes reduced and we just simply call it reduced NAD um, so just a couple of things then thanks uh, a couple of things to point out um, you guys should remember from sort of I think before the summer or the summer work anyway um, oil rig which is oxidation is loss and um, reduction is gain so we're talking about electrons there okay um, so when you're taking a hydrogen atom essentially you're also given electrons okay so you're reducing the NAD it sometimes is written as NADH but we're going to write it as reduced NAD um, another little thing do just keep an eye on those carbons okay because some people get a little bit lost with how many molecules there are and then when they go through the whole if you get a big long sort of question in the exam about the number of ATPs and whatnot they get really lost and they work out the wrong number of ATP so do just be really careful with that all right so um a little quiz for yourselves can you spot the substrate level phosphorylation of ATP Tom, can you can you spot it? <laughs> I think I might have given this one away, but yeah, it's um, hey, it's where we're making a TP um, by taking a P from a substrate and putting it on, and of course, there's the triose phosphate conversion to pyruvate, P being removed and added to Na, or to, sorry, to ADP to produce ATP. Awesome. Um, so again, this is one of those slides that we're not going to spend long talking about okay otherwise we'll be here for hours but um you might just want to stop the video and have a go at this question describing glycolysis okay um this is the answer and you'll need to pause the video and <laughs> write that down if you like okay um all right so we've done glycolysis um we're now going to move on to this sort of the mitochondrial matrix for the next couple of re or the next three reactions the link reaction the krebs cycle and the electron transport chain so we are now here okay um so again it, it takes place in the mitochondrial matrix and it's using the products of glycolysis which is pyruvate um chemists you'll be aware that you know pyruvic acid it can also be called um those who aren't chemists just be aware of that okay and um, so initially we've got our pyruvate from glycolysis again you've got two of those per glucose molecule okay and they're three carbon compounds now these are going to be decarboxylated and you can see they're going to actually produce something called acetyl coenzyme a and in the process of being sort of decarboxylated um, you get carbon dioxide as like a waste product okay so again another waste product of respiration carbon dioxide you guys know that already um, and you're also going to be dehydrogenating it and you're producing a reduced NAD again okay so we take we're scraping off two hydrogens and a, and a carbon essentially and we're sort of smushing it together to make acetyl coenzyme A okay we're going to carry that forward. Um, is there anything you'd like to add, Tom? Just, just a little thing, a um, couple of little things. Decarboxylation is the removal of carbon dioxide. So that's what that's about. Um, if you were adding CO2, you'd be carboxylating. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually do some of that in photosynthesis later on. Um, also, the acetyl bit of the acetyl coenzyme A, that's got the two carbons from the pyruvate. Coenzyme A is actually quite a big molecule which has actually got lots of carbons in but all it is doing is carrying the acetyl the two carbons into the next stage of um, respiration it isn't used for anything else other than a transporter so you know if effectively you think of it as having two carbons those are the things that are actually going to go forward in the reactions cool okay um so we are now here in our krebs cycle 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, <laughs> this is a fairly long and substantial cycle, but I'm sure you will love it, because who wouldn't? Um, so we're starting off with our acetyl coenzyme A. Again, two carbons, and we're going to be mashing that together with a four carbon compound. Again, those of you who are very good at sort of doing reading, reading up on stuff like this, do bear in mind that it, this is a huge topic, and if you're looking at sort of undergraduate books and stuff like that, you will come across much, many more complex kind of Krebs cycles, okay? So don't be getting yourselves in too much of a tiz if there's lots more detail in some of them, okay? This is just the cycle that we're going to sort of look at for um, our exam, I guess. Okay, so we're going to crack those together and we're going to make a six carbon compound. We're then going to do some stuff to this six carbon compound. So, Tom, what are we doing to our six carbon compound? Okay, well, if, if you can see, well, four plus two gives us six, but then that six becomes five. Mm. Um, so we're losing a carbon, and you can probably guess how it's lost. Um, we're going to decarboxylate it, so it's carbon dioxide is produced. Um, and we are also removing hydrogen again and these are used to reduce the NAD, so we're producing reduced NAD in this 6 to 5 step. Cool, okay, um, then we're going to, oh it's gone down to 4, so we're again decarboxylating, little bit of ATP produced there, okay, maybe have a think about what kind of um, phosphorylation that is, um, and we're also taking off some hydrogens that are again going to reduce some NAD, okay. Yep, and now this one is just 4 to 4, um, but there are some changes going on. And we're losing hydrogen again, so we're reducing some more NAD. And then we're doing exactly the same, we're going to take off a bit more hydrogen. You'll notice that we're not using NAD here, we're using FAD, okay? Um, you don't really need to know exactly where the NADs and the FADs are used, but just be aware that different ones are used at different points in the cycle. Okay, um, so... Can we spot the substrate level of phosphorylation? Tom, where are we? I can, yes. <laughs> yeah, okay. So where we're taking a P um, from the 5C compound to produce the 4C compound, and that P is then stuffed onto an ADP and you produce ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. Boom, there it is. Okay. All right, so we've done glycolysis link reaction Krebs cycle. We are now going to have a little look at the electron transport chain. Okay, we're going to look at this... I guess fairly basically, um, it is one of those things that you'll probably want to go back over and read more on or re revisit this video. Um, we've put a link at the end to a really good YouTube uh, video on this, so if you do want to watch another video, then um, you can, by all means, this is just an animation we've made that, <laughs> that <clears throat> isn't massively professional, but it, it does the job. Okay, so um, the electron transport chain. Essentially, this takes place on the inner mitochondrial membrane, okay, as you can see in this big sort of orange band in the middle. Um, that's the inside membrane of the mitochondria. Um, you've got the mitochondrial matrix at the bottom here, which is where the Krebs cycle and the link reaction took place, and you've got the inner membrane space between the inner and the outer mitochondrial membranes, okay? These are all really important in the electron transport chain in this part of the reaction because essentially it allows us to build concentration gradients and to, to generate ATP using those concentration gradients, okay? Um, this theory is called the theory of chemiosmosis, um, because it's looking at sort of like chemical osmosis, sort of like charged particles and stuff like that. All right, uh, Tom, do you want to start us off? Okay, so as Tom said, this is quite complicated and we're just going to try to present a very simple story. Um, but the basic idea is, is all of those reduced coenzymes, so the reduced NAD and the reduced FAD, both from glycolysis, the link reaction and the Krebs cycle, all ultimately end up here at the inner mitochondrial membrane and the blue blobs shown sitting in the membrane are actually there um, it's embedded in the mem membrane intrinsic in the membrane and these are referred to as the electron transport chain so the red NAD brings its hydrogens and dumps them at the beginning of the electron transport chain the reduced NAD is oxidized and releases um, both 
well, it releases its hydrogen atoms as H pluses, so protons if you like, and electrons as well. So what's going to happen, we'll, we'll mention where the electrons go in a second, but when these coenzymes, the NAD and the FAD, the reduced coenzymes, when they come over and dump their hydrogen atoms, essentially you're going to get the hydrogen ions, the H pluses, that will diffuse down these proton pumps into the inner membrane space. And you'll also get, um, so that's what's happening there, and you'll also get the electrons being sort of separated from them that are going to sit <laughs> on the actual proton pump, on that protein, okay? Um, both of these are important at this certain stage, okay? So, go for it, Tom, yeah. I was just going to say, the, um, the process of moving the protons through the pumps and into the space um, is a form of active transport. Okay, so you are actually moving the protons against the concentration gradient. Um, so it's not, not diffusion, but an active uh, <laughs> movement of H pluses from the matrix into the space. And the energy that comes, in order to do that, obviously it's active, you need energy. The energy for that actually comes from this little electron here. Okay. Um, so what's going to happen is this little electron is going to bump on down to the next proton pump. Okay. Now, that, you chemists might have noticed, um, we're actually looking at um, loss of an electron, okay, um, which is um, oxidation. <laughs> I have to write it out, I'm like, oh, which one is it? Um, so, we're looking at an oxidation reaction there, okay, um, and in that second proton pump, picking it up, it's got a little bit more energy, and it's going to pump some more hydrogen ions through into that inner intermembrane space, okay? That's going to happen again. You're going to get oxidation, but you're also reducing um, the last sort of uh, proton pump, okay? And uh, again, we're getting the pumping action of our, our hydrogen ions through into the intermembrane space. Excellent. So as Tam was saying, you are getting oxidation to release the electron, and then the um, part of the electron transport tra chain that picks up the electron becomes reduced. So these are usually referred to as redox reactions, redox reactions, reduction and oxidation going on together as it always does. Cool, okay, so what's going to sort of eventually happen is that you're going to get this build up of hydrogen ions on the intermembrane space, okay? Now this is a good thing, right, because what this means is that we've now got like a kind of a chemical uh, and also diffusion gradient between the two sides. We've got lots of positive hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space uh, more than in the mitochondrial matrix, okay? Um, and that's going to mean that these are going to diffuse via that gradient down back into the mitochondrial matrix through something called a stalked particle, okay? Now, this stalked particle, this is the kind of, I guess, working part of the electron transport chain that essentially generates ATP, okay? So as the hydrogen ions move through that, you're going to get ADP and PI being smushed together to make ATP, okay? So you're getting ADP being phosphorylated. A um, couple of key things here. This kind of system here, um, the stalked particle has like a little rotor blade kind of at the bottom of it and it rotates and as it does you get this like mechanical energy being transferred into chemical potential energy okay um and it's also got an enzyme on it called atp synthase which essentially synthesizes atp okay so it's a really cool really really cool molecule that that synthesizes the atp there cool tom yeah, just to, to reiterate how great it is. I mean, this is a this is a nano machine. It's a tiny little um, machine which um, rotates and generates the ATP. And all living things um, have something like this um, to allow them to produce their their ATP. It's cool. Um, so really, quite quite a, a, an amazing um, bit of uh, biological machinery. Awesome. Okay, so we are then going to use that little uh, hydrogen that's just come out of the stalk particle, okay? And we're going to bring together the electron uh, from the third proton pump, and they are going to meet a little oxygen molecule, okay? And they're going to get along really well and make water, okay? So 
our final kind of you can describe these proton pumps as electron acceptors because they're accepting electrons so our, our final or terminal electron acceptor here um, is actually oxygen okay um, and that's it that's it really that's brilliant so the whole thing is totally reliant on the oxygen hence aerobic respiration because if we don't have any oxygen at the end to pick up the electrons then there is no way Cool. Um, if you do want to have a little look at another video, because I know that some people prefer seeing different types of images and whatnot, um, this is a good link. Okay. Other than that, see you later.